and they are the sort of fish that pellets attract. Look at the difference. So winter's on its way and we're right in the thick of the autumn. So fishing's changing and we need to change with it. So basically we need to think about silvers, the carp will be retracting, they'll be start showing up. And there's a lot of good silver fishing to be had. And you just need to kind of adjust your equipment from the summer months into this time of year. So you need to lighten up the elastics, you need to lighten up the rigs, and lighten up the hooks and think about how you feed. And when you come to a place like this, which is Midlands in the West Midlands, a beautiful fishery, it's absolutely black with silverfish. So here's a great little fishing session just to show you how I go about tackling this time of year and catching those silvers. So, just before we get started, let me talk you through the bait. Dead simple, as always it is with me. I've got some casters, a couple of pints, a few worms, and a simple tin of corn. Now, I'm looking to catch roach and skimmers, basically. And casters are roach's favorite bait. Bream love them too. Skimmers like them as well. Worms are there just to ignite the peg and hopefully draw them skimmers in and put something on the bottom. And then the corn, is just for them bigger bream later on. So if I'm getting loads of little fish, they'll probably leave that alone. So there's always something in to create a, basically a foundation and a firm bottom if everything's getting eaten on the way down. Dead simple. Apart from that, in the bag, and I never leave on without them, are a few pellets, a few uh, feed pellets and some soft hookers. Because you never know, it might be a complete skimmer day and they love nothing more than a few pellets. So simple prep with a few, couple of rigs. It's time to get some bait in and see what we can't catch. So I've had a little plumb round and it's quite a slow, shallow drop off. But then at sort of 11 metres, it starts to get to a depth that I'm comfortable with, which is about seven foot, I'm found at 13 metres. I want to fish for everything. So casters is my main bait, because that'll catch roach and I know the bream in here and skimmers love it. But I'm actually going to ignite that with injecting some worms at the start. So I've chopped a few worms up. I've mixed them together with some casters in a separate bowl. So I know exactly what I'm feeding, what quantities. I've dropped a few grains of corn in there for some big bream and we're going to pot that away and see if that just kickstarts our peg. Best way to get an amount of bait in, especially when it's loose feed like that and there's a few worms in there as I've just described, is via a pole pot. So I'm actually going to put in half a pot and basically, when you are potting bait in and you don't want the fish to come up in the water, dumping, as you might call it, with a pole pot is the best way because it's a large injection of bait in a large quantity, all in one go. And regardless of the fact that the fish want to be off bottom, what they will actually do is that will force them down where we find them easier to catch. So that's the bait introduced, which is a nice amount of bait which should give me a good start. So while that's just settling, and we're gathering a few of them lovely Midlands fish into the swim, let me talk you through my two basic rigs. So the first of the two rigs is a through the water rig. Now, I've not got shots spread all the way up the rig. It's a four by 14s, slim bodied float, with a nice bristle that I can see. And the reason why it's a slim body is because the shape of the body allows the floor to settle evenly and the shots and the weight of the rig will pull that floor and cock it. But what I've actually done is it's quite a concentrated spread of shot. That's 45 centimeters from the knot uh, of the hook length to the top shot or 18 inches in old money. And basically, my shots get further apart the closer to the hook they get. That's about five inches, four inches, three inches, two inches, one inch, and bunch to the end. On to the bottom of that, I've got a nice sensible hook, which is a B911 F1 and an 18, and that's tied to 010 uh, Aki Power Line. Perfect rig for catching everything falling through the water. Roach, if it does go through the roach and settles on the bottom, you'll probably catch the big fish on it as well. Then, the second rig is a little bit more positive. This is a 0.6 float, 
and that's a completely different shape altogether. That's a bulk and basically that is a round bodied wire stem, slightly thicker tip. And the reason for that is that as I just explained about the slim bodied float which settles nice and slowly, because we've got our shots in a bulk, we want all the buoyancy of the float to be taken up by this bulk of shot. So the float will settle really quickly because we're trying to get through the small fish. And then just underneath that, I've got three droppers, six inch hook length again, because I'll probably have four inch of that hook length on the bottom. So I've got a slightly bigger size 16, 911 F1, 2010. And then this little shot will sit two inches just above the bottom. And then I've got a three inch and a three inch. And then I've got my bolt there. Just off the bottom of that bulk is a little kicker shot, which I've just separated by about 10 mil, which just stops any wrap overs of the uh, dropper shots beneath it, and it kind of can't wrap over and tangle. Nice simple rig, so you've got through the water, and then when I feel like there's some bigger fish, or I'm trying to get to the bigger fish, I can pick this rig up and catch them a bit more effectively. So we'll kick off with single caster because we're putting casters in and I find that single caster is quite an obvious bait it's what I call sort of man enough to select bigger fish you can put maggots on but I sometimes find that if you're feeding casters you should fish casters on the hook now I've just took that in a sort of semi buried style so the point of the hook is showing, but probably 50% of the hook is buried into the caster. So it's in, in the top, out of the side, so that we've got a nice point, and when we get that bite and we strike, we haven't got to break the shell of the caster with the hook, and we should get a cleaner hook up with the fish, like that one. And then, that means less bumped fish, and of course, more fish in the net. Now, that's actually a small skimmer. Hooked lovely in the lip, like so. And I just find that exposing that hook point gives me the best of both worlds. another fish and today I've actually selected the four to six pink zip because of course we're balancing light hook length and small hooks and look at that that's a perch and that's a perfect example of why you have to have your elastic set correctly because perch have got hard mouths and you need to set that hook and I have actually done something slightly different I've installed this four to six just through the top section of my pole. Now ordinarily, I'd have most of my elastics through both sections of the top kit. But by just putting it through the top half with a bung inside it, it's less bouncy. It's a little bit firmer. And I don't mean it's stronger and stiffer. What I mean is that you get the same strength because the elastic is elastic but all that slack in the middle, it gets a bit moingy, and with this, it's a little bit more direct. You set the hook, there's miles enough elastic in there to catch silver fish. No problem whatsoever, big fish, you'll probably still get six, eight, 10 foot elastic out if you hook a big bream or you hook a big perch, but it just allows you, I think, to set the hook. And then another thing, I mean, you might not be quite as sort of in a rush to catch fish as I am today, because. You know, the competitive angler in me always wants to catch fish quicker and... But what it means is I can actually lift the fish and you see that? The elastic retracts into the pole quicker once the weight of the fish comes on. And that means that I don't have to net every fish. I can swing them in. It's a little bit more efficient. But most importantly, I actually think it, it just sets the hook a little bit easier. So if you're using 
a soft elastic with a modern style power kit that's a great tip just to keep everything under a little bit more control and of course I know exactly what you're thinking that means that you can get more top kits out of one spoiler elastic so why wouldn't you what is really interesting so far and it's not quite as I imagined it to be so we kicked off with that pot there I think I'm gonna have to net this one a slightly chunkier <laughs> billet we kicked off with that pot of bait and um, just left it while we just got uh, got everything ready and the first two fish were skimmers well they were skimmers like so they're not 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 massive but and then I caught a couple of small roach and a few perch and what I realized is that's why I've had to put it over there is I picked that up immediately because of course you're getting bites and it natural reaction is to feed and I picked my catapult and started feeding I then started to catch smaller roach and smaller perch and I was getting bites and on way down and it were all a bit mm, bit and batty so I've actually stopped feeding my catapult and I'm actually dumping bait so probably the same same amount of bait in quantity wise per fish if you like so every five or six fish Just picking my pot up a few casters touch of them worms in it, a little bit of corn and putting it in and my idea with that is that I'm not encouraging the fish to come off the bottom I'm trying to keep them on the deck because even though we've got a nice rig on that can fall through the water I always often find that it's a lot easier to catch fish if you can keep them somewhere near the bottom they're less flighty they're a little bit more purposeful which means you get more positive bites and therefore you hit more and you catch more fish so regardless of the fact that we're getting loads of bites it's not always necessary to keep piling bait in. We're putting the same amount of bait in, just in a different manner. And that's a cracking little uh, way to look at it and think about your fishing, because ultimately, the bait's the same, it's just how you do it. So think about what's happening in your peg. If your fish types and the size of fish and, and the species of fish have changed, think about why that's happened. So when you're fishing, just consider those little subtle differences that make a difference to you and how much you catch. And that's another one. There's plenty of these in here. I think it's that time of year when perch start to feed to put a bit of weight on because they tell me that perch breed in the winter and like January, February, the cold months. So they'll be packing on weight now, getting ready for spawning season when they won't feed. The water clears up a little bit, purchase sight feeders. They get the guys, because they're predators, of course. So as the water clears, as it cools and the water clears from, from some of the eagle, I'm reaching for my catapult, which is why I've had to put it out of my way. So natural to want to feed all the time. Yeah, perch, as the water clears, the perch can see the bait better and therefore they have this little spell where A, they want to feed because they want to put weight on and B, they can see the bait. So take advantage of that. There's some great perch fishing to be had. And um, in these commercial fisheries, there's millions of them that never get caught because, of course, I don't think they're particularly fond of pellets uh, and wafters and bandoms and uh, particularly ground bait. So as soon as you start putting casters and worms and maggots in, well, they're all over it, aren't they? So it's time to drop in with the positive rig, the bulk, because there's plenty of fish here, and although that rig is catching fish, it's quite good, I think there's plenty of fish there, and most of them are down near the bottom. So I know we're only pleasure fishing and it's not a competition, and 
not everybody wants to fish at lightning speed, but I just can't help myself from feeling that I can be a little bit more positive. And that bottom section of my rig, which obviously shot a completely different to the sipper that I've just put down, means that my bait will sink faster, a little bit more positive. I've got a slightly bigger, which means heavier hook on this rig, and it's just got it down to the bottom. That would have bite immediately. I've put double cast on that because I'm being greedy. And it might not be that you have to be aggressive with the bait. Single caster might still be the bait. But the rig just completely changes how you fish your peg. Settles a lot quicker, cutting through the water and getting that hook onto the deck a lot quicker. Which sometimes can be the difference in in completely like the species that you catch or the size of the fish that you catch. And that's why we have more than one rig up. Because yeah, we can tinkle along all day catching fish, but the curious one in me can't help but wonder if there's a better, more efficient, quicker way to catch fish. We've had a bite straight away on that. And that's a perch. Now that's actually, out of interest, I put a different elastic on that one. That's the 6 to 8 yellow. And that is through the conventional full top kit. And you'll just notice though, even the fact that it's a stronger elastic, the fish actually hung lower because there's, there's well, there's more than double of the elastic in this, in this top kit. So as I said, you've got that all that stretch, and I've got this on because this is an elastic I've got set up in my pole for all sorts of different types of fishing, and uh, and I'll use it sometimes where we're catching F1s and uh, catching small carp winter, and I just like that extra bit of elastic to give me the buffer. But when we're silverfish fishing, like we've done with the other top kit, and we've just got the elastic through one section. It just goes to prove there's a massive difference in the amount of elastic that you put in your pole. So find one that suits you and make it work for where you go fishing. And I feel like the bites are completely different on this bulk float, so you can sort your elastics and rigs out and I'm going to try and do the same on here. Because it's never over, it's never you can never get it right the first time. So experimentation and thinking about your rigs is really important. Right, a couple of tips which might seem obvious to uh, the more experienced anglers amongst you, but not everybody's been pole fishing all their life. I never go fishing without one of these in my seat box. Because today I've got white water, there's no trees on the far bank and no dark water. So I'm actually just gonna black out the top of that float. Now, I know what you're all thinking, it's permanent. And yes it is, because it's waterproof. But trust me, you will need a black float quite often. And then what I try and do is, I put this back in my box, I leave the red ones um, for when I need the light, and I have black ones for when it's like this. And if you have them both in your uh, side drawer, your rig case, when you get to your peg, just select the right colour. The other tip, while I've got the float in my hands, because I'm just about to put a little bit extra depth onto this rig, is when you plumb up at the start, mark your depth on your pole. Now I know for a fact that I plumbed to the bottom of that float because I wanted it to be over depth already. I'm actually going to go right to the full depth of the float, so I can just move my float, not by much, just an inch, I just want a bit more stability. And I know that when I come back later, if I want to come back, and have two inches on, for instance, like that, my mark is always in the right place. Okay, so just make sure I've got the right depth on. And that is a good way to keep in touch with where you're at on the bottom. So obviously the most important thing that you have got on your rig, on your pole, regardless of elastics, regardless of floats, and regardless of how you shot at it, is the business end, which is the hook. This particular rig has got the 16 911 F1 on it and I'm just picking out a single caster 
and I'm just kind of threading that on so that's semi buried so I've threaded it through the top down quite a way probably halfway down the caster then back out the side that just allows enough hook to hook the fish uh, some people might say oh yeah I'm hiding the hook now maggot fishing is one of the most successful ways to catch fish and you hook a maggot through the top and all your hook is exposed but there seems to be this desire with casters to, to bury the hook and uh, I would say sort of on a clear water or somewhere that's hard fished, yeah, that might be an advantage. But I think on a commercial fishery like this, where there's quite a bit of colour in the water, I mean, look at that. They weren't shy of that, whether they were stuck out or not. Um, there's a little bit of colour in the water and the fish are quite hungry. They never get these luxurious casters thrown at them like we're doing today. They don't mind a little bit of hook protruding from the bait. Plenty of them to be caught in a venue like this with a simple size 16 hook and a single caster. These fish are quite interesting today. There's been no shortage of bites, but I have noticed that as different fish have moved in and out of the swim, the whole day's fishing's completely changed. And I'm currently going through a bit of a strange spell where I think there's a lot of fish in my peg I think some of them are liners. Um, we've had a little run of skimmers, which you'd think, oh great, they've rocked up. Um, keep popping a bit of bait in, popped a bit of corn in because there were lots of perch and I wondered if the worms that we were introducing were encouraging too many perch. And just following that, we had a little run of skimmers and then I think they've backed off again and at the moment there's a few fish in there but I can't really catch them and I was fishing the bolt rig which were quite you know effective quite quick settle up quick quick bite and catching fish but all of a sudden now I think fish have it's gone quite flat as well and I think it's always important to keep an eye out what's happening and when it goes flat I actually think the fish become a little bit more precarious and sometimes you've got to be aware of conditions like the wind because you might think, oh, it's the way I'm feeding or it's uh, the way I'm fishing or I've changed my rig or they want something different. And yes, you might find that a change in what you're doing affects how you catch. But sometimes it's just that the, the lake changes and the fish just go off, off peak a little bit. And what I'm going to say to you is that, just bear with it, don't immediately presume that just because we've had them skimmers and they've gone that there's a lot of skimmers there now and we can't catch them because the liners and doing it wrong. I, I actually think it might just be the wind. It's gone like glass. So I've picked up the light rig again because I find that when fish are uh, a little bit more wary, sometimes pays to scale down and if I'm in a especially if I'm in a match what I would probably do is try and keep the fish coming because not only does that build up your lovely net of fish but it also keeps you in tune with what's happening in your swim so you can sit there all day thinking oh yeah they'll come back they'll come back might be that they've gone all together so picking up this delicate rig single caster smaller hook if you're not catching on that and you're still getting indications you might need to completely rethink the job you might need to just move or fish to the side because you sometimes get silt um, I mean this is a sandy gravelly uh, type fishery the bottom of this this one so it's not silty as, as such probably might be in the deeper sections but not here but sometimes if you are fishing on commercial and the peg goes a bit iffy, you can actually just kickstart another swim just off to the side. It might be that that's, and I mean, that, were, that looked like a definite bite, I missed it. Um, it might be that the pegs become a little bit cloudy, they're pushing bait into the silt, and you're not getting a clean swim. And you'll have heard that said so many times. And just moving, see, I'm beginning to wonder if they are liners, because. We've not missed any bites. 
that'll probably just give us a, a fish and I think that's a small roach and that's probably what we're missing bites from it's a little perch look now although we've put an odd fish in there I think it's time for a rethink so I'm just going to change things up a bit so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do now here we go So, Peg's gone a bit iffy, we've had a few skimmers come in and as I touched on earlier, I always bring a few pellets because that's what these fish are used to eating. We've had a great session catching perch and roach and odd skimmers, but I've got a funny feeling that there's probably more skimmers wanting to feed than we're catching. And one very effective way to catch skimmers, probably because it eliminates most of the other fish, is pellets. Let me talk you through what I do to prepare a day's pellet fishing. Two ingredients that you need is some feed pellets. You'll have seen me do this before. I filled that with dry pellets this morning. I filled all the gaps up with water until the lid was, uh, till it was right up to the brim. And then popped the lid on. They've been soaking since very early on. Squeeze a few of them out. So they're all well soaked right the way through. I'm not going to need tons of them so I'll probably leave a few in the tub, squeeze a few out. But I know that they're fully moist and therefore they'll sink quite well. So I'm just going to take a few of them out of there, pop the lid back on. Now because it's seven foot deep, unfortunately there's not a lot of tow, I'll get away with these two mils. But what I will do is add a little bit of water to them just to make sure that they're heavy because the more water they take on the heavier they'll become and because they're pre-soaked they won't go to mush all we're doing is making sure that they're fully wet and that'll just help them to sink we can either tap them in loose or we might be able to just give them a little nip and that little lump will sink to the bottom to make sure that we get them down where we need them to be. The second thing you'll need is some up bait. I've just undone this bag. I poured some dry expanders into the corner of the bag last night. Put some water into it. Tied the bag up. So it's basically a similar amount of water to pellets and like made a little cone shape in the corner. And the idea of that is that the pellets can take in the water but they don't expand because the restriction of the bag being tight like that means that they can't expand so they take the water in but they don't blow and become too soft and then I've just dropped them in a little bit of water they'll be on my side tray I can pick them out and they're firm enough to stay on the hook but not too dry so let's go and see if we can make these work I'm going to kick off with this little nugget of pellets. I've just got them a little squeeze. The reason for that is I want them to sink quite quickly. Now, as I'm fishing in a little while, I've got the opportunity to either keep putting an odd one in, or we could just put a little pot on the end of our pole and dribble pellets in. But I just want to establish pellets because, of course, we've been fishing with casters. And I've just dropped that in. We've been fishing with casters and the fish it onto them. So I've put a few more than I would normally if I were just kicking off to pellet fish. I'd probably put half that amount in. You don't need tons of pellets. They're quite a potent bait. And when you think about the size of a pellet, there's a lot of bait there, as in individual particles. There's probably 200 pellets there. So you don't want to overload your peg with bait because you want the fish to pick up your hook bait, like all fishing. So what I'm actually going to do now is just adjust one of my rigs to suit this, and I'll explain why what I mean by adjusting it. So the first thing I'm going to do is adjust the depth, because when you're pellet fishing, you don't want as much line on the bottom as you ordinarily would with casters, worms or maggots. And the reason for that is because the way that the fish mouth 
now the pellet. So I'm just going to plumb up. Now this should be over depth because that's how we've had it. And what I'm looking to do is just find the depth that should be just the bottom of the body is how I like it. So that when the bristles settle, you've just got the body depth and the length of your, the bristle minus what you've got showing, just that amount on the bottom. Because when I think a skip, what I think a skimmer picks it up, unlike a, a caster or a maggot, they don't kind of take it in and kill it in the back of the throat and chew it. They kind of mouth pellets, and you're just looking for little dinks and taps. So it's important that you don't have too much line on the bottom because they can pick it up and spit it out before you've even realised if you've got too much line on. So getting the right depth on a pellet rig is really important. The next thing I'm going to do is shorten down the line above my float because you haven't got quite got as much time. They won't hang on to the bait as much as I was just describing the way that they take it. So I personally like to shorten my line right down so that I can just lift and drop. And a lot of the time you get a little indication, lift up and there's one on, it's in the mouth. So we'll just adjust that up. Now I've terminated my rig in a cross foot style. So I'll just flick that off. And then basically I'm looking at my, my float here. And what you want to do is go to the minimum. Now, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, you need four inch, six inch, you need eight inch, blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, not everybody can fish with a short line above the float. So my advice is to fish as short as you possibly can without it being difficult for you. And what I mean by that is, so you can ship out without tangles. I hear lots of people say, it's very difficult to ship out with such a short line like the pros do it. So do it to suit you. Now, there's not much wind today, and I'm going to go down to about that length. We'll start there and then we can always reduce it further, but we can't add it on. So I've just figure of eight. Get rid of that line in a minute. Just put that there for safekeeping. And then just lasso the rig, which is basically pass the line through the loop over the top of the elastic, and that's hitched. You'll see that just with my thumb, just slide it down to the back of the knot and then with one of the small, smallest of the beads that just goes over the top of the loop and the termination of the line and just holds it in place. That then is basically me converting what was a caster rig into a pellet rig. You saw what I did with the hook pellets which is basically I've just soaked them in the corner of that bag and then I'll just take a, a little pinch out of them and a lot of these will actually float and you'll see that and what I like to do is just drop them into the water give them a little gentle squeeze not not a hard squeeze because I don't want to crush them and all that does is squeeze a little bit of the air out which makes them sink and a little trick I've learnt from a great angler called Steve Clark was sometimes you don't squeeze it quite as hard so not as much air comes out and the pellet will just fall slowly right at the end and that just gives the skimmers more time to, to, to grab that bait. If you want them to sink quick because it's towing a little bit or there's a few little fish around, squeeze it a bit harder and it'll sink a bit faster. That's a cute little tip that Steve passed on to me that I found invaluable. So we've converted to pellets on a hunch. And obviously because we wanted to target skimmers, that's why we made that change. And we've been feeding pellets for 20 minutes or so. And we're starting to get a few indications. I think there is a bit more tow, uh, underwater tow, than um, I first probably get it credit for. And my last few bites, I've just come off a skimmer, have come from probably best part of a metre 
down tow, so in this case it's off to the right, the wind's blowing right to left and the tow's obviously going the other way as it does. And um, sometimes pellet can take a while, I mean, when you're gathering an amount of skimmers, you kind of have to build your pegs slowly and in my experience, pellet fishing, once you get it started, it just gets better and better. So patience is something you have to have. Um, that just like a little indication then. I mean, that's lovely, isn't it? Look at that. And I'm definitely convinced, because that one was a long way down the swim, that the toe is probably a lot stronger than I've given it credit for. This is a 0.6 bulk, and it's sat... I mean, they are small skimmers, don't get me wrong, but they sat, um, the float sat lovely, so you kind of think, well, it's not towing that much, but the bulk shot of, the, of that uh, rig is considerably heavier than the two mil feed pellets. So they are probably falling and landing a lot further downstream than I first thought, so no point in wasting time running your float through your swim. And it's one of the best ways to be efficient is basically just tap your pellets in on your marker where you started and then drop your rig in a metre downstream, basically. And they are the sort of fish that pellets attract. Look at the difference. A net full of them will definitely be a different day's fishing to a net full of them cast a perch, won't it? Stunning fish. And this like another good skimmer and they are there but I think it's just a tricky day where they're not particularly getting their heads down but the pellet is without doubt I think I described it as a select, selective bait and that is the quality of the fish that it picks out because don't ask me why I don't know if it's because they prefer a quiet swim and the pellets put all the little silverfish off and the perch off and that allows them to settle but it certainly is very effective so we've proved that obviously starting on casters like we did catching fish we could have sat there all day and probably filled our net with beautiful looking net of fish and been a really active day but i just wanted to demonstrate that you can actually change your peg up and select different fish. So it's the same swim down the same line. I mean, obviously we even cropped down that rig and just showed you that we turned our bolt rig into a pellet rig just by basically shortening the line down, fishing just over depth and not further over depth like we did with the caster. Um, 16 F1, uh, sorry, 911 F1 pellet up there. And basically the similar bulk and three droppers. Tapping pellets in, what's not to love about that? So there you go, an interesting day's fishing here at Medlands.